So thank you for inviting me um, to speak to you all and for having me here today. I'm excited to get to know you all. Um, I am a business attorney. I practice employment law for a while. I'm also a community college educator. But more recently, I have become a business coach. And in addition to the other things, right, because I need another thing to do. Um, but I have been really focusing in the past year on, on mindset, but also from uh, the neurological perspective. So understanding really how our brains and our minds work because mindset shows up and understanding how your brain works and the synapses that fire in your subconscious shows up wherever you are, whether that is in relationship with people close to you, making sales or starting a business or whatever it is that you want to do. So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is about how to get the results that you actually desire um, but because I kind of switched it up, right, um, I am curious about what you all are doing and what you are hoping maybe to get out of uh, the mastermind or get from me today so that I can make sure that I cover those areas and those topics. So whoever wants to pop off with mute first and let me know maybe a little bit about yourself um, and what you are doing and what you're hoping to gain from today, that'd be useful. Uh, I can... Oh, go ahead, Sean. No, you go ahead, Taki. Okay, so so me, that's, I, I had a few things. Um, obviously, all of us are uh, certified closers, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you, I've spoke to you a little bit about the agency that I have, and uh, we close deals for high ticket uh, people like yourself, and right. um, also uh, just looking at your biography, there are a few things that kind of come to mind. Of course, all of us are, uh, a, a lot of us in the room today are also uh, people who are going out and uh, building their own agencies as well. So uh, knowing the ins and outs of um, the legal aspect of that, um, and I'm sure a couple of the people that's on here can agree, uh, even with the setting up our LLCs, it was, it was crazy. It was something that <laughs> we just did not really know. And we were bouncing ideas off of each other and, you know, using legal Zoom and things like that. So there's a lot of questions that we have in that respect. And also because of people that I also uh, know here in the area, Sacramento uh, being one of them, uh, the, the, um, the situation where you, you say you do uh, record expungement. Mm -hmm. I've spoke to individuals uh, trying to go through that, and um, it's it's a lengthy and ex expensive process. And also um, how that ties in with, okay, let's say the business person has some some legal issues that may make his uh, um, his uh, I guess his persona look better. Mm -hmm. it, how, how important does that tie in with? Uh, the business person that's that's trying to get ahead, but may have some past uh, legal issues going on with. So that's one of the things um, I'm interested in. Uh, okay, you can go ahead, Sean. Oh, hi, Asia. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Okay, so I guess along the lines that Taiki was talking about. Um, um, I'm actually, uh, I finished uh, the Closer Academy, like the last part of last year, and I've been kind of uh, struggling a little bit, trying mm -hmm. to get established, mm -hmm. and I actually started going through the um, Closer Agency um, training, but I, I started the, that training late. Um, I work full-time right now to support myself as a commercial driver. Mm -hmm. So I do that like uh, six or seven days a week right now. Um, and like I said, I had a couple of uh, rough starts and I decided that I wanted to actually start my own agency and just um, work for myself so I don't have to deal with uh, somebody else else's uh, management structure that might not have my, my best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wanna be able to um, take the, the experience that, that I've had and help people that are going through the, 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 the training to mm -hmm. be able to get established and 
not to have to go through some of the um, pitfalls that I had for myself. Mm-hmm. But right now, I, I guess I'm, I'm just uh, I just finished doing the um, the legal Zoom um, process to to get my LLC formed. Okay. But I, I didn't opt in to to get them to help me finalize the the entire process. Mm-hmm. But they sent me like all the documents for the EIN and the the articles, um, the different um, items that I guess I'm supposed to file with the state. Yeah. I'm here in California, okay. I'm up and down in Concord right now. Okay. So, um, I'm not Got sure it. if you you might have a little bit of insight of how to uh, like finalize like the. I know I have the 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 documents for like uh starting up getting my um bank account established for the business account and everything like that Mm -hmm, but as mm -hmm. far as like finalizing all the the paperwork and just um yeah um how how to not um get into a situation where where i'm contracting people to to do work in the background Okay, and, I got you. And how to um keep like every all the assets that 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 I'm asking them to help me with um um secure as far mm-hmm. as like uh if they're helping me like establish like the different um social media platforms or okay if they're they're helping me to expand my my CRM okay type of, gotcha to, to work with different customers and stuff like that. So gotcha, gotcha. So I won't, I, I won't it. be able to cover all of that stuff today, but I am for everyone putting a link in the chat for um, my consultation calendar to to um, talk about the business, the more specific business needs and things like that. Thank you, Sean. Anyone else want to share what what else is what you're hoping to get from today and where you are right now? Looking at Jesse. <laughs> I'm in the beginning stages, but but it's good to to find out about um, sources like you, and so I can jot them down and 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 get to them at a later date. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, one more thing, uh, Asha, are you do you handle like tax uh, situations that um, come up? No, I don't. Um, I've got a number of accountants that I work with, though, or that I refer business to. And if needed, a couple of attorneys that work on tax issues as well. But we're going to try and get to you before you need an attorney to step in on your behalf for the tax issues. <laughs> and then it's, is it Shelly, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm actually not starting any business as of now, but... Mm-hmm. You know, listening to successful businesswoman like you actually encourages me to start my own soon. That's why I'm very excited for this one. Awesome. Good. And Miss Adrian? Yes. Um, I would like to know what made you decide, Asha, right? That's how you pronounce mm-hmm. it? Asha. Mm-hmm. Glad to see you and um, you're an inspiration, definitely. Thank you. Um, what made you decide to, to want to help entrepreneurs? Yeah. Okay. So that that's actually a, a perfect segue. So thank you so much for that question. So I never thought that I was going to be an entrepreneur. It was not something that had crossed my mind. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that I really realized my dad was an entrepreneur because I didn't get included in the business part of it. I'm, I'm in my childhood bedroom in Portland, Oregon, but as my as a kid, my dad had a Christmas tree farm. And so he owned the farm, did all the work and stuff like that. It was just something he did. I didn't realize it was entrepreneurship or that he was running his own business. I started out doing employment or I started out doing medical malpractice, switched to plaintiff side employment. So I was representing people who had been wrongfully terminated. They'd been terminated because someone said that they were a part of an ethnic group that they didn't want there or that they were discriminated against because they were a woman or because they were pregnant, things like that. I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless. And then I realized there was a lot of pressure and it was a lot of like emotional responsibility to be helping folks when they had lost their jobs after this traumatic event happened. I thought, okay, well, maybe I can work with business owners and hopefully cut down on some of these lawsuits. And I like to think that I made a difference with that, um, but couldn't prevent all of them. And I started adding business advice and business counsel 
to my employment law counsel because I was working with smaller businesses that didn't have a huge need, had some need for employment law, but really they needed the business advice. And somewhere along the way, forming LLCs, somebody asked me, he said, great, Ashan, you formed my business for me, but now how do I keep my money like all the rich folks do? And I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't yeah. have an answer to the question. I thought it was a really good question. I knew how to legally start the business. I knew all about contracts. I knew about employment law, but I hadn't gotten to that level yet where I really understood that entrepreneurship, a business, an LLC, a corporation is a wealth generating tool. And that really sparked, Adrian, to answer your question, how I started really focusing on entrepreneurs and primarily entrepreneurs of color, because we know the economic situations that a lot of us have come from. We know the systems that make it harder to find that economic success. Yeah. But in my opinion, becoming successful as an entrepreneur is one of the fastest ways to change your own economic situation, to change the economic situation of your family. And then you get to hire people from your community and who you want to hire and you make this exponential impact out around you. So not only is it this tool, this mirror that's going to challenge you to grow and evolve and whatever issues you have personally, they're going to show up in your business. You're going to be forced to work with them. It's this great personal growth tool, but also it's the biggest tool that I find for change that you can implement in a relatively short time. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but I think it has the potential to have a really big impact. So very importantly for us, especially some folks who come from marginalized communities, it's really important to have that LLC or that corporation. It's really important to have those contracts because those are the legal tools that will protect your personal life yeah. from your business life, Yeah. right? So the benefit of having an LLC is if you sign on to this big contract and you promise this customer that or client that you're going to close 10 deals in... 10 days, let's say, and you're not able to do it, now the, the client has a problem with you, then if they're suing you for something, they're suing the business yeah. and they're not suing you personally, which means that your business is the legal entity that's responsible and not you, not your house, not your savings accounts, not your retirement accounts, not your personal assets, not the things that you share with your spouse or your family members, right? So it's really important, especially because and those, it takes about two or three years for a business to start to become profitable. We are in that this time of like microwave, instant, overnight mm. stardom. It doesn't happen that way for most people. So if you are at a point where you're like, I'm doing this, I'm trying, I'm not getting the results that I want, you are probably exactly where you are supposed to be on that path, no matter how uncomfortable it is. And it's not the end of your journey. It's just a piece of your journey. Right. Well, so these yeah, legal yeah, tools yeah. like the LLC, like the contracts, like hiring the right people help you to build and grow your business so that you can maybe your goal one day is to step out of the business a little bit and have everybody working for you and you're taking the profits. Right. Maybe your business, your goal is to build this business up and pass it on to your child or niece or nephew so they have a business to step into that's called building generational wealth. Maybe you don't wanna do this for the rest of your life, but you wanna take a page from the tech industry and build this business and build it so that some other company will acquire your methods and your strategies. And now your exit strategy was selling your business for a million dollars and now you're sitting on the beach with half of it and the other half is invested so you can keep living you know, with my ties and your feet up for as long as you want to, right? Yes, your yes. Your business is a tool for being able to take control of your life, for building freedom economically, both financial freedom, building time freedom, building location freedom if you want, to just be, to decide who you want to be and how you want to be. But again, that is the dream, that is the vision, that's the calling, but the work is so important and it is so important to make sure you get that foundation set up correctly. And I think after joining a handful of mentorship and coaching programs to find those people in your community, they call, I call it the fab five, your attorney, your accountant, your business mentor, your business coach, and then a really good friend or family member that you can rely on. So it's your attorney, your accountant, your business coach, a good friend or mentor, I'm out of order now, and 
was it? Or, or I'm sorry, a mentor and then a good friend. I combined those last two. Okay. So the friends well, I'm is attorney for obvious reasons, right? I'm sorry, Adrian, go ahead. Oh, that that wasn't Adrian, that was me. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> I'm seeing the little yellow good. box pop around, so I'm trying to catch it. Okay, so <laughs> Maybe maybe I'll I'll just wait until you finish. I'm gonna okay. <laughs> so so the attorney is important. I heard you all talk about legal zoom, and legal zoom can be used as a tool. But the challenge about legal zoom is that it's only a question. It's only it's asking you questions, and if you don't know how to properly answer those questions, mm. it's going to take your answers, no matter what they are, and put them into their computer generated system and create this entity for you. But that doesn't mean you know how to use the entity. It doesn't mean that the that you chose the correct entity, it's, right? It's just taking what you have given it, um, which serves a purpose, but it is really important, in my opinion, to meet with an attorney just to make sure you understand how to use this tool and to understand what your responsibilities are with this tool, right? The CPA or the accountant, meet with them sooner rather than later and a bookkeeper too. I'll put those two in there because it's so important to make sure that your books are done correctly when you have your business because your books are what the CPA or the accountant is going to use at the end of the year to file your taxes. As a business owner, you have to keep your personal assets and your business assets separate. You have to keep your personal money and your business money separate. And if you wanna be able to take advantage of all the tax write-offs that you can get as a business owner, you have to have a separate, you have to have an accounting system and it needs to be separate from that. But also working with the CPA can help you determine should you be an LLC or a corporation for tax purposes. The attorney will help you figure that out too, not necessarily for tax, but for liability. The CPA will help you determine when is the right time to file the S Corp tax election. That's not an entity. That's, an, that's a tax election that LLCs or corporations can take advantage of. And it just changes the way that you're taxed. So in our business community, people say, oh, I'm an S-Corp, I'm an S-Corp. They're not really using that term properly because it's, a, it's, a, it's an election for how to be taxed, right? But they either have an LLC that's taxed as an S-Corp or a corporation that's taxed as an S-Corp. There's a certain time when you're making a certain amount of money that, you, that it will be advantageous to file the S-Corp tax election. And if you do it too soon, you could end up paying more money or you may be choosing that election when you don't actually qualify to do that yet. So attorney, accountant, mentor. You wanna have someone that is in your field that's a little bit further along than where you are right now. Because that, you know, just like it sounds, they can help guide you. They can say, hey, you need to meet this person. Why don't you think about this? But it's, it's that mentor relationship. It's not quite coaching, right? Coaching is different because coaching can come in the form of business strategy. It could come in the form, it, you know, you, people can be coached on a number of different things, but my recommendation is to find a coach who can give you some strategy, but also who has the mindset piece of it. And I'll, that's what I'll, my presentation will be on in a few minutes, um, because the biggest challenge you will have will be your mindset. But the one thing you have complete control over is your mindset, Right. And there is this blend now of this more sort of like spiritual and tactical, um, bridging the whole, you know, the masculine and feminine energy, spiritual and tactical, blending both sides because you are a dynamic human being. Our culture really celebrates, our business culture really celebrates the do it, the push, the go hard, no excuses. But as a human building this business, you also have to take care of your mind and understand how your mind works to actually get the results that you want, Right. So attorney, accountant, mentor, coach, and then a good friend or family member. I have a lot of supportive people in my life. Not everybody knows how to support my entrepreneurship journeys. I love my mom. My mom is fantastic. She worked for the same school district for 39 years. That was job security wow. for her and her generation. She's terrified for me as a business owner. When I started teaching full-time at the community college about four or five years ago, now I had already had my own practice for about six years or seven years. And she was like, oh, thank God, you got a job, right? And I'm like, I've been, surviving. <laughs> I've been surviving for seven years as a business owner. But for her, job security was working for an institution, a corporation that would provide that regular paycheck. For me, job security is understanding how to generate my own revenue because no one else can take that away from me. Right? <clears throat> a job could always yeah. fire me. But if I know how to go out there and make money for myself, I can always go out there and make money for myself.
doesn't mean it's always going to be high, but I know that I can rely on my own tools and skill set to do that. So not everybody is going to be the support that you need because not everybody has been in your shoes. Mm. Not everybody gets yeah, it. I read that a stat awesome. that about only 8% of Americans are entrepreneurs, something like that. It's really low. When we get wow. into these groups, right? We self-select and it feels like everybody around, I feel like everyone around me is an entrepreneur, but that's not actually true. It's a really small subset of the population that is an entrepreneur, which means it's a small subset of people that actually will understand what you're going through. It doesn't mean you can't tell your friends and family member that, you know, that you're doing this, but another um, client I was coaching the other day, she said she started her business, I think full-time in like November, December, quit her corporate job. And has been, you know, traveling and, and like making some money in her. She went to go visit her mom and her mom was like, okay, so when are you going to go back to corporate? And she just, it just hit her because she was like, oh my God, my own mom, I'm struggling to believe in myself because this is new. My own mom doesn't believe in me, right? Like it's not that your mom doesn't believe in you. It's that safety for her is going to work for corporate. And so you're not going to be able to share those business struggles with your mom because she doesn't get it. So she, so she's going to tell you to go get a job because that's what she knows. She's not going to be able to coach you through something the same way as someone who has been in your shoes or is walking along with you on that journey. Right. So that's my, my advice for the Fab Five. Um, in terms of expungement, Taki, to, to answer that question, so the beautiful thing about being a business owner is it doesn't matter what your criminal record is. Mm -hmm. When you do business with people, business to business, the business entity is the one that's contracting. It's the business entity that gets the background check, if you will. You know, they don't usually run background checks on businesses, right? right. So now that doesn't mean that if you're working in a sensitive situation, if you're working with, you know, healthcare files or things like that, that they might not ask to run individual background checks on the individual people who are going to be doing the work. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, right, they're not going to do that for business. But if you are someone, you know someone who has a record, cool, no big deal. We're going to figure out how to work through that because now you're the business owner. Mm -hmm. And for the things that you're not able to do, you hire someone who complements your skill set so they can get into places, work with people that you're not able to do, to do or to work with. But also in California, there are some, a number of crimes, a handful of crimes that are charged with what they call wobblers. That means it could have been charged as a felony or a misdemeanor. The people who are eligible for expungement have been charged with a wobbler that's usually charged as a felony. They can go to court after they've paid the fines and penalties and serve the time and they haven't gotten in trouble again. They can ask the court to drop it down to a misdemeanor. A lot of background checks are only looking for felonies. And then when the question on the job application comes up and says, have you been charged with a felony? You can legally answer no, because that expungement paperwork allows you to legally answer no. And then misdemeanor, I think most misdemeanors can be taken off your record as well for expungement, for, with, through expungement um, after a certain number of years after you know everything is said and done. So it's a really, really good tool. Um, at American River College, we are we have implemented the expungement clinic now as a class for our paralegal students. So they're learning how to do the work. And so it's a free clinic there. We were doing it on the weekends and the pandemic hit. Um, Sacramento County Public Defender's Office will do the expungement also and clients don't have to pay for that. And there's a handful of other organizations that are around. But mm -hmm. um, some depending on where they're getting their money from, they may have certain criteria. So at one point, the PD's office, public defender's office, got a grant to do expungement for folks who were homeless, which is great. But also there are a number of people who have records that aren't homeless, right? So right. Yes. it's great, but also super narrow. I think so they I call it LSNC out here or something like that. Legal Services mm -hmm. of Northern California. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And they have requirements also because they do uh, public benefits. So oftentimes their folks will have to be receiving a public benefit, also like a housing benefit or a food benefit or something like that. But it doesn't hurt to ask because they all have, you know, referral partners as well. So there, there are more and more um, organizations popping up, especially with cannabis now being legalized, that, and unfortunately, it's not an automatic um, expungement. It should have been, right? It should have just automatically converted by law, but they didn't do that. But that is definitely, um, you know, a crime that is no longer a crime and that you do have to go to court and ask for that expungement. But there are a lot of organizations that are working 
um, to make that happen as well. It's only not a crime on the on the on the state level. It's not the federal level yet. Right, state. So this is yeah. So I'm only talking about the the state crimes. The federal, yeah, federal is a different. I don't think they call it expungement. Um, they they might call it expungement on the federal level, but it's different rules. Different rules, different crime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so. Well, I appreciate all the information you just gave. I tried to write down as much as I could. But, um, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, curve and I'm understanding it's and um, it's really good that they have all these different programs coming up now to help the homeless. Mm -hmm. People with minor offense, you know, jumping the turnstile or whatever they did. And um, they have an opportunity to clean their slate and then get a, a job or just start to breathe again because mm -hmm. you can't get a job because you got all of these different things going on in your background that you did many years ago. That's not fair. Right. Right. And um, I think it's really great. Um, even though everybody's saying the world is like against everybody, but apparently they're opening doors for people who are at the bottom of the totem pole, who are um, lifting them up and giving them opportunities, which is yeah. what we need to do. Right. And guess what? As a business owner, you also have the ability to hire who you want to hire. Right. Which feels like a big responsibility. It can feel risky, but you are also part of that resolution as well. If you want to be a part of that resolution, no, no pressure, right? No pressure at all in that direction, one way or the other, but mm -hmm. just to help you help all of us to realize how powerful entrepreneurship is to serve our community as well just want to put that out there because we can all play a part in that. Um, Taki, can I share my slides? Yeah. yeah. Enable the... um, I think uh, Chelsea uh, is... I'll make you host. Okay. There you go. Oh, the whole host. I feel powerful now. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Okay. So um, I'm assuming you all can can see my slides. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to pop off of mute or, or interrupt me as we go. But I, I, I did have, have one question uh, right uh -huh. quick, Asha. Um, sure. You mentioned on the Fab Five, uh -huh. a business coach and a mentor. I'm trying to understand the difference between the two. Yeah, so a mentor would be someone who is in your industry that's a little bit further along or, or has a similar interest, right? Like whether it's investing or building a, a closing business, that's a little bit further along that just kind of um, might open some doors for you, someone you can talk to, share ideas with. Mm -hmm. But a coach is someone who's going to help you implement some strategy. They're usually looking to, maybe you wanna work on one to three specific issues with them, whether it's setting up the legal entity um, figuring out the operating procedures and hiring your first employee, whatever it is. There are coaches for writing a copy. There are coaches for um, doing sales, right? So it's it's like, you know, if you're playing on a sports team, the coach is the one that's giving you the strategy. He's giving, looking at it, the game from the outside and telling you where to go and what moves to make. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So priming your brain to get the results that you desire. So again, this is what I've been working on for the, the past couple years, most of these things were in my bio that you read, but this is the new one that I'm a, I'm a certified neuro coach, which means that I went through a year long training program with a woman named Dr. Shannon Irvin, who is a licensed psychologist who's developed um, really a training to help people learn how the brain works and how to get the results that we desire. So I went through her program and now call myself a certified neuro coach. So what I'm hoping that you will pick up today is how to hack your brain to get the results that you want. So all of it, most of you, it sounds like have entrepreneurship dreams, whether you have started in that, maybe you want to go to that one day, or maybe you just want to, I don't know, get more clients that you're closing for all of the, maybe you want to, you know, get fit or take a trip or, or whatever, right? It's whatever it is, I'm going to show you some steps to hack your brain to get the results that you want. So you may or may not know this, but 80 to 90% of our daily decisions and actions come from our subconscious brain. Subconscious meaning we're not necessarily aware of it, right? Mm. Um, I was uh, with my friend like about a year ago and I don't know, it was like noon. And for whatever reason, he went to the bathroom to brush his teeth. And before he knew it, he like 
put shaving cream on his head and start to shave his head. But he had already done it in the morning, but because he, the trigger was brushing his teeth. And every time he would brush his teeth in the morning, he would shave his head. And so in the middle of the day, he brushed his teeth and then started to shave his head. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? That trigger brushing his teeth and then shaving his head was in his subconscious. That was an automated program that he didn't have to think about that he caught himself doing at some point, but it wasn't a conscious decision to shave his head the second time, even, even in the morning, right? He's automated this belief. So even though we think that we are choosing everything that we're doing throughout the day, we're only choosing about 10 to 20% of our decisions. Most everything else is on autopilot. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's because our brains are trying to keep us safe. It's because doing new things, if you've ever tried to learn a new method, you probably just went through the academy, your brain was probably tired as you're learning these new skills, right? It's because it takes glucose, takes sugar, takes energy to create a new synapse. So it's a thought here and an action over here. Your brain makes that connection. It becomes wired. Once it becomes hardwired in the subconscious, your brain doesn't have to spend as much energy. When you're creating something new or disrupting an automatic belief, then your brain has to spend energy. So I remember going to law school and I had never been so exhausted in my life. because I was learning all of this new stuff. You're learning a language. It's exhausting. If you're learning a new system, it's exhausting. Starting a business, it can be exhausting because you're creating these new, this new wiring in your brain. And so the result is that your subconscious has automated beliefs and your beliefs create your decisions. Right. So that's kind of the, the big picture about it. But whatever you believe on this subconscious level, that's going to determine the decisions you make in your life. Mm. Right. It's going to de determine the decisions you take in your business. It's going to determine the decisions you take or make in your relationships. Right. And again, we gain safety from this automation because we trust that our subconscious knows what it's doing mm. that routine is intelligent it works right i know that after my friend knows that after he brushes his teeth he's going to shave his head it has not failed him yet i know that when i get ready to what well, i'm thinking about what do i do ah another automated thing as soon as i come home i turn around and put my keys on the back of the door right in the beginning it took me a minute to to put my keys there, but now I do it. I don't even realize it. I keep doing it because my brain has told me I have not lost my keys since I started putting them on the back of the door. So it's an intelligent routine. I don't have to think about it. It works. That's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. But that also happens even when um, our beliefs are negative. We may not even see them as negative. This is, this is why new things seem scary because they haven't yet been programmed into our subconscious and our subconscious interprets it as being unsafe. So this is why starting that business feels scary. This is why reaching out to that potential client feels scary. This is why calling the CPA to understand taxes feels scary, not because it actually is unsafe, but because it's unfamiliar. And our brain knows that stuff that's familiar is safe. Even if it's not like having a drink every night at the end of the day, probably not the safest thing to do, but it's familiar, right? Or it can be familiar. It's routine. And so it, we do it on autopilot without really thinking about it. It's hard to break that habit because our brain has said, we know what this result is. It's safe because we know what it is. So when you're trying new things, when you're the ideas are easy to come by, easier to come by. But when it comes time to taking action, even if you say, I want to go out there and close 10 new clients today, but you know, by 11 a.m., you've only called one, right? And you're like, I don't understand. I, I have done this multiple times. I don't understand. I really want to make this amount of money, but then I'm over here not actually doing the things that I need to do to make this amount of money. It's because there's something about this action that you're thinking about taking that feels unsafe. And it's most likely because it's unfamiliar. Or maybe you had a negative association because you did call one client and they rejected you, or, you know, whatever, right? So it's, it's not that there's anything wrong, but it's understanding how your brain works that you can begin to coach yourself through these situations. 
So how do you train your brain to get the results that you want? Um, let me see. I mean, what are some of the goals that you all are working on now? Like, tell me like 10 seconds, what's a goal you're, that you're working on now? I have one to uh, change at least one life uh, every day. Okay. Thank you. What else? Uh, get, get my LLC established and get um get this uh, agency up and running. Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else? Me as well. I'd like to get my agency up and running and also help people. Um, mm -hmm. At least every day, uh, someone, so they can move forward with their plans. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anyone else want to jump in? For now, I wanted to really, really do save in order for me to be able to open up my own business, hopefully mm -hmm. next year. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome. Looking at Jesse again. I don't want to cut you off if you want to share, but I don't want to force you if you're not, if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll move on. So here's here's the model, right? Thinking about your goal, thinking about the steps that need to be taken oftentimes to get the goal. Here's the model so you can begin to coach yourself. So we're talking about everyone's goal was about a result, right? You want to help people. You want to form the LLC. You want to start the agency. You want to start a business in a, in a year or so, right? That's the result that you want. Your result is going to be determined by the action that you take. So if you want to form the LLC, you got to take the steps to form the LLC, right? You got to actually file it with the Secretary of State. If you want to start the business, you have to do the steps to start the business. But what informed our actions? There comes a point where we have to make a decision. I'm going to decide to take an action. I'm going to decide to go for the run. I'm going to go for the run. At the end of the run, I will have lost, I don't know, not realistic, but like a pound, let's say, right? The result I want is a pound of, of weight loss. The action is to go for the run. That I have to decide to go for the run. But what's going to lead to my decision? It's my belief. Do I think that this is going to work? Do I think that I am worthy of losing weight? Do I think that I am capable of losing weight? Do I think that I deserve to lose weight, right? And what informs our beliefs? Our beliefs are really just thoughts that are repeated over and over and over again. And how do we know what our thoughts are? Oftentimes we know because we have an emotion. So if I'm saying I want to lose some weight and I'm thinking about the actions and decisions, okay, well, how come I'm not making the decision? Well, because I believe that it's not going to work for me. Why do you believe that? Because I was so disappointed when I tried before. Mm. Okay? So the thought, so that disappointment will give you, that's the cue that there's some thought there that's going on. The thought is that, well, I tried it once and it didn't work, so it's probably not going to work again. If I'm telling myself over and over, I tried it once, it didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. That becomes a belief that it doesn't work. Mm. If I don't believe that it doesn't work, or if I don't believe that it does work, then I'm going to make a decision that supports my belief because our brain wants to be right. So whatever that belief is that is created by your repeated thoughts, whatever that belief is, that belief informs your decisions. Your decisions determine your actions and your actions dictate your results. Mm -hmm. So it really comes down to, to these thoughts here, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. One of the things that I one of the things that I struggled with in business and I'm still working through is um, is like taking up space, like being seen. Right. I'm fine when someone's like, hey, Asha, come and talk to me. Um, or would you like to host this thing or do that? If there's an invitation, fine. But if I am like so like going live on social media today is like cringy to me. Like, I, ah, like, who am I to just stand up and like just do a monologue and, and why would people want to watch that, right? Those are thoughts. Who am I to do that? Where does it come from? It comes from because as a, as a little girl, little girls are taught they're supposed to be seen and not heard, especially if you have Southern parents, right? Mm. It comes from um, people, my dad telling you, okay, well, you just you just like attention, don't you, right? So <clears> I <throat> develop these thoughts that it's not okay 
to put yourself in the spotlight. It's not okay to take up this space without being invited. So then I believe that because it's repeated over time. It's not okay to just take up space unless you're invited, right? So I don't think it's okay to take up space unless I'm divided. Why would I get on any social media platform live when that's something I know could help me build my business, but I'm confirming my beliefs. So if I don't think I should do that because that's not what, you know, respectful little girls do or respectable little girls do, my decision is going to support my belief that respectful people don't ask for the attention. And guess what? The result I'm going to get is a direct result of the decision that I made that's based on the belief that I held that came from those thoughts that are repeated over time. So in so order to you, get a, mm -hmm, say it again. I'm sorry. So in order to get a, a, a different result, uh, we have to do something that's that's different and we have to use our, our mentors and coaches in order to to guide us in a, a different direction than what we've already learned uh, as a part of our environment and our upbringing and the, the influences that we had um, from our parents and our friends and our environment growing up, right? So we have mm -hmm. to use those mentors and coaches in order to kind of push us in a, a different direction to be able to get the results that we actually desire as opposed to the results that we, we pr are presently getting, right? Right. So, but I would say a mentor or a coach that understands thought work, right? Because we've probably all been in those situations where it's like, um, I don't know, maybe it's like a Tony Robbins experience or you come and you come someplace and you're like all excited, like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym every day, right? <laughs> I'm going to New Year's every time. Everybody has a weight loss goal for New Year's, right? Or like you go come home from a conference, like, yeah, I'm fired up to do this. And you, and you, are excited about it and then a couple of days later a couple of weeks later you go back to your same patterns that's mm -hmm. because your underlying thoughts didn't change mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so it's important i think if you want to spend good money to work with a coach or a mentor a coach primarily that understands thoughts and understands that mindset work because someone can give you the skill all day long the skill's not usually the problem. There's, there's strategy, like especially if you're newer in the game, you need to learn some things, right? But after a certain point, you don't need to learn, you need to execute. But if you don't think that you are worthy of building this business, if you grew up without money and you, and grew up in the, okay, that grew up without money, grew up in the church. So church it has a lot of stuff to do with money, right? Good people, good Christian people don't have a lot of money. Right. Or even in the Bible that God is always with the poor. I was talking with my podcast editor about this and she was saying like she she's a Latina woman, grew up in East San Jose. They went to church all the time. And, and the, the priests in the Catholic Church would say, you know, God is what she grew up for and God is always with you. So she had this subconscious belief, this thought like, well, if I'm no longer poor, does God still love me? Right. And that's something that was programmed. This thought was programmed for when she was kicking. You know, we probably all heard it. Like God was poor, you know, the least of these, I'll be the first, and the, you know, the, all that stuff. Right. But if that's a thought that you're repeating subconsciously, you may not even come up. Well, when you get to a certain level of income, you may not be able to go past it because you're thinking subconsciously, if I make more than a hundred thousand, if I make more than a million of whatever it is, then maybe I'm no longer a good person. But oftentimes, because these thoughts are subconscious, we don't actually know that we're they, that they're there. You know, I didn't. I just knew that I didn't really want to so, show up on social media because I'm like, this is I don't want to do this, right? And then people no, are asking, what is behind that? What is behind that? Why not? And then, so you know, folks who understood thought work were asking me what was really going on. I was like, oh yeah, it's because of the the attention. There's someone else in my community who also is named Asha, which just irritates me so much. We're like night and day we're like oil and water right this lady calls for so much attention and i again learned as a kid that when i was calling out for attention my dad would very much say like you're it's too much you're you know you just like to be the center of attention so i learned that i should not ask for attention i overcorrected in that way the other asha didn't have a lot of attention as a kid but she learned if she wanted the attention, she's got to ask for it. 
So a couple months ago, I was like, why does she irritate me so much? And I, I had to really like think about it. It was because of this, this work that I've been doing with the neuro coach model. Oh, she, she gets on my nerves because I learned I wasn't supposed to ask for attention, even though I wanted it. And she learned to ask for attention because she wanted it. And that her action triggers me because it's a direct contradiction to what I thought and believed to that repeated thought over time, right? I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I've done this work because now I understand that her, like me being irritated with her is not her, it's me. It's that thing that it's calling up in me. So now that I understand that thought, I can change that thought. Wow, she wants some attention and she's courageous enough to ask for it. Cool. Wow. Right? It doesn't have to I like how you mentioned that a good coach understands that. And I, I was looking at the chat and even Jesse chimed in about uh, those type of coaches that understand that it starts with mindset and mm -hmm. uh, us in the room to right now, we all know that uh, our training, it actually starts with uh, what's called intro to awareness. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. That's uh, kind of cool that uh, we know we're on the right track because, uh, and, and I've noticed this with other uh, coaches and, and mentors I've had through the years, it's like the good ones, they always start with mindset. They always mm -hmm. start with that intro to awareness. So yeah, um, that's definitely a good point. Yeah. And it's so easy to be like, ah, I don't need that. Someone else in another one of the groups I'm in the other day, uh, a lady was like, there's a difference between a, a pretty thought and changing your belief, right? You can have a pretty thought about a situation that didn't go the way that you wanted. I sent out 15 emails and I only got a response from three. Well, at least that was three, right? But changing the, the belief about it is that I'm going to send out these emails and it is going to work. Or I'm sending out these emails and I know people want these emails and that the right people will respond, right? So it's not just, the thought work is not just like, oh, it's a beautiful day. It's not like toxic positivity, right? It's really understanding what are those underlying thoughts that are getting us to where we're going because it doesn't always have to be a negative thing i guess talking about it and not getting the results that we want but we can also look at it as and where are you getting the results that you want and what are you believing about yourself what are you thinking and believing that is driving to that result and you can see how you're thinking over here and maybe how you're thinking on this other side compare and contrast and then change your thoughts about this area that you want to improve in because I know that there's there's spaces when you're like, I got this, there ain't no thing, right? Mm. Like to come and speak to a group, no thing, doesn't bother me at all. For my one of my friends, she's terrified to go live on social media. I just hate it. So how I could look at my own thoughts about what's the difference between being invited to a group and showing up and speaking off the cuff versus, you know, going live by myself. And I could choose to adopt that same thought pattern to get a different result. Um, going live. Yes. So that was my my quick um, quick version of the the introduction to the the thought work. And again, I think it's so important because the skills are going to be the skills. You're always going to learn the skills. That's fine. But learning the skills without really believing or thinking that you are worthy of whatever result that you were looking for mm -hmm. is going to make getting to that result much harder if you're able to get to it at all, right? right? Because our brain is always going to confirm what we believe to be true about ourselves. So that's why I want to make a million dollars and I'm over here doing $20 stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Even I, <laughs> Easiest one, Every year I want to lose 10 pounds, right? I say it, but what is my real belief around losing 10 pounds? Do I think I can? Do I think I should? Do I really want to, right? Because we say it all the time, every January, and then most of us don't end up <laughs> doing it. That's the cognitive, cognitive dissonance, saying that you want <clears throat> one thing and having a competing underlying thought that is in direct contradiction to that. You're going to do what the underlying thought is, what the underlying thought says. So it's important to get to those underlying thoughts. And there's layers. There's lot, definitely lots of layers. 
to change those thoughts that you repeat over time because then they become the beliefs. And your beliefs will end up dictating your actions and the actions you take based on your beliefs will get you the results. Wow. Wow. Thank we had to change that. our underlying was... thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Adrian. No, I was I was thanking her for that because it it explains it explains it very simply. But when you're trying to figure it out yourself, it's like it gets bombarded because you have different thoughts coming from many different angles. Mm -hmm. And um, you just laid it out plain and simple, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I have to work on some issues of my own. <laughs> we all do. Everybody does, right? Because yeah. there are thoughts that we've created about ourselves, but most of them are thoughts that we have heard from other people. Yeah. You know, they're parent. I mean, oh, I grew up sad. again in Portland, Oregon. We were the only black family in the neighborhood. There might be like three now, <laughs> maybe. I don't <laughs> see people wow. walking every once in a while. So as a kid, and my mom was a principal in the same school district that I that I grew up in and that I went to school in. And so she would tell me, she was the only black administrator in the district as well. And she would tell me like, Asha, people are watching. They know that you are my daughter and you better not ruin my reputation and you better not ruin your own, right? And it didn't come from like, you better not do this, but it was advisory because people mm -hmm. knew who we, I played sports as a kid. So we stood out. And that thought, that still shows up when I'm, I went to Kenya and I was like, what would my mom say? And I'm like, why am I thinking about my mama in East Africa, right? <laughs> but that thought is still there. And it's not that it's not true. It was definitely useful at the time, but it's, was it, it's not useful in that context anymore. And so our brains right. are so smart that they have learned how to keep us safe. But what we have to do is realize that that um, loop that was playing may not be the right loop to keep playing right now. Well, exactly. You got to get a new a, a new uh, set of uh, operating instructions. Absolutely. So it's like yeah. it's like we had to totally reformat our thinking is what you're saying. Or for, maybe the, our for the for the things that are not working, because there are things that are working there. You wouldn't be where you are. If something hadn't worked. Right. Right. So it's so it's not it's to get to that next level. If there's something that like some obstacle, you're like, I just keep getting stuck in the same spot. That's a cue to examine the thoughts around this obstacle, right? There are people who are, um, like they'll set an income goal, like I'm gonna make $70,000 this year and they get to 70,000 and they can't seem to make 70,100, right? They can't make 70, because whatever it was that they, whatever thought they formed around that number, 70,000 was okay, but more than that was excessive. More than that was greed. More mm -hmm. than that, you know, already that's it's beyond meeting the needs and it just wasn't necessary. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's and they don't necessarily know that until someone helps to point that out. Wow. That's interesting because uh, Alexa, stop playing. Um, that's interesting because there's a book actually that I've been reading uh, for like the past three years. I just read it over and over again. It's called um, creating a bug free mind mm -hmm. and it speaks about how a lot of times we try these uh, self development things and they're not working. But what's actually happening is like a computer If a computer has a virus and you try to load that uh, new software on it without clearing yes. the virus out first, then it doesn't work. And right. I like uh, what you said about also how people like they have a mindset of like 70,000 and they don't go beyond that. Uh, Ed Milet, I, I think uh, everybody mm -hmm. in the room has heard of him. He talks about that thermostat, like mm -hmm. the thermostat in your house is set at a certain number. And whenever you drift out of that, uh, those, that threshold of that number, it kicks in to either cool the room or, or warm the room. Right. The same thing with our thinking. So, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. so connected with what, what I've been uh, studying lately. Yeah. And that, and what you said about um, you have to undo the old program, right? That is that is a piece that I think a lot of folks who don't understand thought work miss because it's like layering the new skill on top of the thing. But if the under if there's still a virus on your computer, 
right? It doesn't matter how much software you load on top of it because the virus is still the root of the problem. Right. And so going to like a conference, being all, yay, that's like adding a new program, which can be useful. But if you haven't cut the, so it's um, the synapses, right? Those under, mm-hmm. those, um, those thoughts that just fire automatically. If you don't cut those, if you don't disrupt those thoughts, you can program new thoughts, but it's still on top of those old unhelpful thoughts. So there's, they call it synapt- synaptic pruning first to cut those things, interrupt those thought patterns, and then to rewire, create new thought patterns that are serving and useful. You got to bring in the, uh, the, the demolition squad for the foundation that wasn't working in order to build a new foundation that's going to actually uh, be able to support the weight of the the um, new thing that you're trying to build for yourself, mm-hmm. right? The new mm-hmm. future, yeah. The new vision that Jesse's, you have for yourself. Yeah, and to Jesse's point about judgment, right? Getting hung up on judgment. You are not the only one. I am someone who judged myself a whole bunch, didn't even know that it was judgment, right? And, and that's the work to do too, to take the judgment off to take that criticism off because even behind the judgment, there's some thought there. Like why, you know, what is the thought that's causing the judgment to occur? But yeah, judgment and um, I did like some shame work a couple months or like six or eight weeks ago. I didn't even know shame had showed up, but I was embarrassed about things that hadn't gone the way that I wanted them to. Felt ashamed because I felt like I should be further along Right, all these shoulds, whenever you, whenever I should, we should, it should, 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 that is a key to you, a, um, a marker to you to know that there's some judgment and there are some thoughts that are unhelpful because should, like, don't should all over yourself, right? right. And I, I had, I didn't know that it was, I had never named it shame. And someone said, well, it sounds like there's some shame. Why don't you do some work? And I did this visualization, this meditation. It was like, if you look in the mirror, you know, see the stuff that you're shameful about. What if you just took the shame off? What would you see? And it was like, you know, the movies where like the cloud cover, it, you know, comes off and the birds start chirping. It's like, ah, you know, <laughs> like, that's how it was like, wow. Maybe I can see all of these. Yeah, totally. It's like dynamic, blissful, like scenery because I could see all of these things that I had done that I couldn't see before because I was judging myself for the things that didn't go the way I expected them to. And when I chose to, when I made the decision to not believe in shame, to not think shame, to not think judgment, then it was like so much more expansive. And to to continue that and say, no matter what happens in the future, I'm not going to shame myself. That means that I'm much more willing to take risks because if I, if I decide I'm not going to subscribe to shame, I don't have to be ashamed or embarrassed if I do a launch and it doesn't go anywhere. I don't have to. That's a choice right? Mm-hmm. The circumstances are always neutral. It's the thoughts we think about the circumstances mm-hmm. that have us in a tailspin. Yeah, it spirals out of control. It's like if we mm-hmm. let like our thoughts are, drag us down a lot of different paths that are away from our actual goal, right? Right. And also, um, it's uh, the people that you have around you as well. You have to make decisions to, if they're negative talking to you constantly and, and you can't share positive information with them, you have to sever <clears throat> that relationship because it's not working anymore. Right. And they'll right. forever be who they are, but that right. doesn't mean and you have to stay there with them. Yep, and the hardest group of people to do that with is family members. Mm. Yeah, those are the people that we're always, you know, we're supposed to be in relationship with, right? Those are the ones who can get to us more than anybody else. Yeah, we it's, can't actually sever the, those relationships completely. Right, because we're not taught to, especially if it's like a toxic parent or something like that. Well, they're your dad, they're your mom, they should, you know, your auntie's old, they're not going to be here forever. <laughs> yeah, they like, give you guilt trips, but <laughs> you have to, you could, you could love them from afar. Yeah, yeah, totally. Setting boundaries is perfectly fine. Yep. Great. Great. Oh, sure. Something. I just lost my mom a couple of months ago. I'm sorry and, to hear that. And, and um, yeah, I got a. It's like you, you don't want to bring it up, but it's like I got a lot of negative uh, influences from from 
the, the way she raised me. We were mm -hmm. pretty poor and she she had the job at the post office. Mm -hmm. But I, I was raised, born and raised in, in the projects and she mm -hmm. had a lot of uh, limiting beliefs that she, she taught me. Right. It's affected me like probably up to like the, the past, um, I want to say 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. And it's like I, I had to totally get out of that 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 environment in order mm -hmm. to to try to figure out who I was. And it's right. like I, I had already gone down down the path that, that she set for me. And it's like I, I had to go through a lot of um a lot of trials and tribulations and suffering and torment. And it's like I was able to to survive that. Mm-hmm reunited and she's she was born again and you know she was um the past uh five years of her life was like a lot different than you know the the previous like 40 years right mm -hmm, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so um yeah, yeah I, I know exactly what 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 everybody's kind of trying to say it's like um you, you have to be around the positive influences and people that that actually are doing what you want to do and that are living a lifestyle that you want to live and that have mm -hmm. the have the um, information that you 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 want to be able to incorporate into your own life. Right. So right. you don't want to be hanging out with people that are that already um, feel defeated, that are living that defeated lifestyle, and that mm -hmm. are that are going to drag you down. Right. You want right. to be absolutely. Yeah. Uh, reaching up to, to people that are going to take you to the next level as opposed to like um, settling for, for what you've been settling for in the past. Yeah, and they say that we are, you know, the sum of the five people we spend the most time around, right? Right. So if you spend time around people who are entrepreneurs focused on building businesses, guess who you're going to become? If you're spending your time around people who were like, yeah, we're going to build wealth because we're going to learn how to invest. Guess what you're going to learn how to do too. You spend time around folks who were like, what was me? This is the best we got. It, we're just, we are a product of our environment through no fault of our own. So there's no judgment. Like don't judge yourself for what you uh, were told or what you believed when you were younger. Cause when you know better, then you have the choice to be able to to do better and to change those thoughts. But all of those thoughts at some point served us, right? They kept us safe at some point, you know, the don't trust anybody. That's, that's not helpful as an adult, especially trying to build a business. But as a kid, maybe that was really helpful because you didn't know who to trust. You were surrounded by people who you couldn't trust, right? So there's no judgment for that thought because it served you at some point in time. But now you can check and see, does this thought still serve me? And can I choose something else that will serve me better? So it's like this, this radical sort of self-acceptance doesn't mean that we don't keep moving forward and don't keep trying, but you know, it's, it's accepting the great parts and the not so great parts and working to sort of integrate them all and, and to make different choices moving forward. Yes, sounds great. Thank you for sharing that too. Um, just as my mom often said no to me for various reasons of thinking things weren't safe or thinking I wasn't capable or just something was a good idea for whatever reason. So if I ever wanted to do something, I had to just do it. But her perspective still influences me today that I still keep trying to get over that judgment and believe that it's possible to do something. You're not alone. Definitely. Totally normal. Our parents were trying to keep us safe, even if they harmed us in some way. They, you know, one of the best thoughts that I could ever have uh, about either one of my parents that they did the best they could. And if that if they would have known better or been able to do better, yeah. they would have done better. Right. So that just kind of gives some space to to kind of forgive a little bit or kind of, you know, like put them in there. But like, yeah, they said the thing that they knew to be true for them. Did it serve me? Did it hold me back? Did it, you know, yes, 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 probably. But also it wasn't done to me, right? It wasn't to hold me back. It was completely a reflection of either how they felt about themselves, what they knew to be true, or the best way that they knew how 
to keep us safe. And we are not those little kids anymore. Even though we may still might still be parent and child, you know, parent and daughter, parent and son, parent and child, we're, we're not in that same situation. And that's actually how when um, like trauma comes forward or like PTSD, mm-hmm. it's, it, and I'm not a psychologist. This is just like what I know just from reading about stuff is that there's an event that happens that triggers that old memory. Yep. But we're never in that same situation again, but we can still get triggered by that memory. And so it's important to go back to those times when those memories were formed or when those thoughts were formed to again, recognize what was the situation that I was in when my dad told me I wouldn't do X, Y, Z. When my mom told me I would never do X, Y, Z. And to realize that 20, 30 years later, we are not the same people. We're not in the same situation. The world is a different place. And that I don't have to believe this thought anymore because it is not designed. It was serving me back then. It doesn't serve me now. So what thought can I think that will change my belief and allow me to take some action to get the result that I want? Thank <laughs> you.